Hi, I'm Sarah from Choices Coach. This is another episode of Faith Training. And in this episode, I am going to cover dressing the mind for battle, putting on the full armor of God. So this is about the mind. This is not necessarily about the body, but Paul, when he writes this to the Ephesians, uses such a very clear picture of dressing the body for armor, but I want you to realize this is really about dressing your mind. And I'm covering this because in the last episode, last two episodes really, I covered dealing with negative emotions. And once we've cleared out those negative emotions, we've learned how to cope with those, learned to take those to Christ, all that good stuff, learned that you know our thoughts precede our emotions, well, now that we know how to deal with that, we also just want to armor up. If we've cleared out the cobwebs, cleared out the negative thoughts, now we really need to armor up because the enemy's not gonna, he's not gonna just leave us alone. He's actually probably going to try to pull us back down again with those negative thoughts, especially while it's so fresh. So we definitely want to put on the full armor of God. So what does that mean exactly? Well, it definitely is dressing the mind for battle. And since most of us probably aren't used to going off to war, some of these pictures that Paul has described, we may not feel like we relate to them that well. But what the Lord showed me is that it's kind of like you don't wanna go straight onto the field when you're playing a football game. You have your time in the locker room, not just putting on your the pads, the helmet, all that stuff, not just dressing the body, but they actually will get pumped up in the locker room before they go out and play the game. You want to just go, oh, I just got here and now I'm going to go out onto the field. Like, no, no, no. Like, your mind has to get ready for battle. And, uh, and also to kind of look at it as a football game, we don't want to make light of it, but also we're on the winning team. We got to just understand that. Like if, if the gospel were the Super Bowl, like we've, we've already won, we've won the Super Bowl. It should be like, yes, like, yes, like, yes, right? Just as you would be like so excited for your team. You should be like that times a thousand times a thousand times a thousand for Jesus Christ that I mean we have victory we have eternity I mean it's amazing I can't even wrap my head around it you know what I'm saying like there's so many reasons to be thankful and to worship that's your mind fuel right there is renew your mind in that that we have won the Super Bowl we've won the World Series we've won the World Cup like whatever gets you excited. Maybe you hate sports and this doesn't work for you at all. But whatever you see as a huge win, a huge victory, we already have that. Times a thousand, times a thousand, times a thousand, times like one million, like whatever, whatever, like to infinity. Like there's no, there's no number here that really works. But point being, we have to dress our mind with that. We have to dress our mind with that, that we have everything that we need, that this is not the end. Whatever our circumstances are, this is not the end. We are, COVID-19 is not the end of our story. Uh, being unemployed, not the end of your story. Being diagnosed even with an illness, not the end of your story. Death is not the end of our story, period. That is the beauty of the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died and shed his blood so that we could be covered, atoned for, and have eternity, have forgiveness, have peace with God, have a relationship with God by the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, that we're no longer separated from God, that we, if we've accepted Christ, that we get to have this beautiful relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can hear from him, that he'll tell us 
that we're his child, that he'll tell us he loves us, that he forgives us. It's the most beautiful thing. That's the armor that we have got to armor our minds with. So let me go through the scriptures here. It says, finally, this is in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. His might, not our might, his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, what is, what's the schemes of the devil? He wants to lie, kill, destroy. He wants to steal your destiny. I mean, if he had it his way, he would kill us. That's why he does a lot of the things that he does. That he wants to destroy people's futures. He wants to destroy everything. He wants to destroy our the plans that God has for us. Plans to do good works. Things planned long ago before we were even born. Okay, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So this is happening in the unseen, in the heavenly places. That means we can't see it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I think too many people too often just cherry pick the parts of the Bible that they want to believe. And if it doesn't fit in with what you consider your reality, then you want to, ah, I'm just going to skip this part. No, no, no. Like you, you cannot battle your enemy if you refuse to believe that he exists. You're going, that's like setting your armor down and being like, ah, skip that part. Like, how are you going to defeat the fiery darts of the enemy, the thoughts that he's trying to plant in your mind, if you don't even recognize the attack? That you're like, oh, that's just me and my sinful nature. It's not always just you and your sinful nature. Sometimes there is a direct attack. And the thing is, some people would have you believe that, oh, well, you only have spiritual warfare if, if you did something well, hello, we've all sinned. So then that there's like, you can't, you're not out of the boat. Like that's, that doesn't completely make sense. But also, I mean, this is the thing we can have opened up a door to warfare because of our sin. But the thing is we've all sinned. So the question is, is it always that? No, it's not always that. Sometimes there's counterattack warfare because you are spreading the gospel. People are like, why is there so much warfare in churches? Because churches are the ones doing the work of spreading the gospel. There's going to be warfare. If you're a missionary out there in the mission field, you're, you're attacking the enemy line. That, that's what we're doing when we spread the gospel is that we attack his line and there's counterattacks. There is counterattacks. He wants to stop us. He's not trying to stop people who aren't spreading the gospel. He's trying to stop people who are spreading the gospel. That's where the war is, right? You don't send all your soldiers in a place where there's nothing going on. You send your soldiers where this is where we, we have the attacks, this is where the war is at. That's where you're sending your troops, right? So that's what the enemy does. You know, he may cause chaos, but he is orderly in his attacks. You know, it's like, for example, you might have warfare in a relationship with someone, maybe in your family, maybe even somebody within the church where the enemy's like saying a bunch of accusations to you. Well, then he's trying to get that person to do exactly what he's accusing them of so that he'd be like, see, you know, that, that's kind of how it works. It's like, for example, uh, he might have one person be very, very prone to being controlling and then the other person very prone to escape. Like, oh, like, for example, and you're probably like, oh, well, that's just human nature that you just want to escape someone that's controlling. Like, yes, but there's also a sinful nature to that, that like being overly passive because you're just like, I don't want to deal with anything. And then there's this dysfunctional 
relationship that is birthed out of that like someone being really obsessively controlling and smothering mothering when it's not a mother relationship if that's not your role then don't take that on with that person if you're not to mother that person in this relationship you can have a lot of dysfunction by being very super controlling over someone when God didn't give you that authority. I mean, if he's given us free will, he didn't give it to you so that you could steal it. I mean, because who likes to steal things? The enemy does, right? So I hope that made sense to you. But I just wanted to illustrate that he's attacking one person this way and then trying to get this person to prove it. You know what I mean? Like, here's the accusation, trying to get this person to prove it. All right, moving on to the armor. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. What is the truth? The truth is the gospel, not minus anything, not adding anything on. The truth of the gospel. So it's very important as a Christian that you know exactly what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have got to sink our teeth into this truth that Jesus is the way. He is the door. There is no atonement without Jesus' blood. We know from Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, that it is the life by the blood that atones for sin. You cannot have atonement without blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was the sacrificial lamb, the sacrificial lamb, to pay for our sins. He died, rose again, three days later. He was in the tomb for three days, three nights, three nights and three days. He arose, resurrected. Jesus came in the flesh. He died in the flesh and he rose again, our resurrected, glorified King and Savior. 50 days later, there was the outpour of the Holy Spirit. He was with the disciples for that first 40 days. Then he ascended 10 days later after that. So 50 days later after he arose, there was the outpour on the day of Pentecost of the Holy Spirit. So this is the beauty of the gospel is that because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he paid it all so that by believing in him that we, if we confess and believe that he died and rose again, that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God, that if we confess that we believe by faith that he died and rose again, for our salvation if we confess this with our mouth we will be saved and he is faithful to forgive us of our sins if we must confess that we believe that he died and rose again that he died for our sins that we are sinners and that he's the righteous perfect unblemished lamb that is the eternal sacrifice for our sins that he he's our savior he saved us from death. That is the truth. So we don't add anything to that. We don't take anything away. And when I say don't add anything to that, I mean it's not our works. It's not our works. This is grace. This is the gift of God. And then out of our truly changed heart and mind, we will do good works because faith without good works is dead, as James said. So we can't add to it though. We can't claim that we have earned it. We can't claim that we have earned it. And then we don't take anything away from it by like saying, well, he did that for everybody else, but not me. Well, no, he did that for you too. He did that and he did that for your neighbors as well and the people that have sinned against you. So we don't take anything away from it. And also that we we want to make sure that we are not opening up our mind to postmodern 
thought, which is like, oh, anything goes. I think anything goes. You can believe whatever you want. That's not the belt of truth. You can't believe everything and then claim to believe the Bible. If you believe the Bible, then you don't believe everything else. And a lot of people want to be all wishy-washy. So the belt of truth means we're not going to be wishy-washy in our beliefs. We're going to believe God and God's word. Okay. Where was I? Okay, the belt of truth. And then having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So what does that mean? The breastplate of righteousness. Well, there are consequences. We reap what we sow. So if we go down a wicked path, we make some bad choices, some sinful choices. We let our sinful nature take over instead of, instead of walking by spirit and walking by faith. Well, then we're opening ourselves up to a broken heart. That's what it means. Plain and simple. Uh, the enemy loves, 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 loves to entice us. He loves to entice us into bad things. He tries to get us to follow natural desires at the wrong time. He likes for us to try to, he, he likes to try to get us to jump out ahead of God when God didn't tell us to do something and it wasn't time yet. Um, he likes to get us to veer off track by the lust of the eyes. You know, what are you, whatever you're looking at, you're filling your mind with. So if you're looking at a lot of stuff that you know you shouldn't be looking at, you're probably going to have a lot, a lot of lustful thoughts. So don't do that. Like, be careful what you're looking at. All right. Verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So this is the beauty of the gospel is that we have peace with God. Jesus died so that we could have, that the wrath for sin could be satisfied, fully, fully satisfied in this sacrifice. And so we have peace with God, that we can have this relationship with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just the relationship with Jesus. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father as our Father. Beautiful. And so we need to be ready with the shoes of peace ready with this. I mean, how lovely are the feet that spread good news? We spread the good news of the gospel. Our feet need to be ready to give a confession of faith. We have to be ready with an answer when people ask us, what's the reason for our hope and the joy that we have? The, the reason is Jesus Christ. It says for us to be ready with that answer and also to be gentle with that answer. We need to be gentle and respectful, not not um, not disrespecting people or treating them like, oh, you're an idiot if you don't know Christ. No, none of that. Like, we don't want to be like that. We want to be kind and loving and be respectful that God has given everybody free will. And so um, we plant seeds and then just trust that the Holy Spirit will water them. And, you know, people have that free will. They can, you know, they can follow him or not. And when they don't want to follow him, then we shake the dust off our feet, as he told the disciples. And we don't try to force it on people. We're going to have to trust that the Holy Spirit will water those seeds. And, you know, we can pray for people to come to know Christ. But we need to be respectful and kind and loving in, in the ways that we spread the good news. Moving on here. Um... Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So this is the thing is the enemy's always going to try to cast doubt. He's always going to try to make us question what God is telling us, question the scripture, question everything. <coughs> He's always going to try to veer us off into doubt. And so we have to pick up our shield of faith and just extinguish those thoughts when they come, thoughts of fear, the thoughts, I mean, he's, he, he tries to plant thoughts with a desired effect of us delving into those dark negative emotions. And so we have to be on guard with that and have faith in God. Verse 17, and take up, 
take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So this is the thing is that there's a reason that these two things are, are listed together. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, they're listed together because we need to fill our mind with God's word and that sword of the spirit. We need to, when negative thoughts attack us, we need to claim and decree and declare the word of God. It's not just, oh, I'm just dwelling on it. That's part of it. That's the helmet is dwelling and meditating on it. That, that is the helmet. Like, what am I filling my mind with? But the sword of the spirit is saying the word of God because God's word will not go out void. It will accomplish the purpose for with for which he sent it forth, including slaying the enemy when he is trying to get into your thoughts and get into your head. Case in point, I had something a long time ago where the Lord asked me to do something and I felt I felt like the warfare attack, like the enemy did not want me following through in obedience to what God was asking me to do. And he was attacking me with fear. And I said four different verses out loud and immediately felt peace. Just such a release like of peace that it was like, oh my gosh, like, thank you. And I, I was able to walk out exactly what the Lord told me to carry out without any further attack. There were no, no further thoughts or crazy ideas of what was going to happen and how this was going to go. It was just like the enemy was just silenced. It was awesome. I mean, God's word, it will accomplish what he set it forth to do. Okay. Verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So, praying in the spirit at all times. That means we partner with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our intercessor. He prays for us when we don't know what to pray. He, he prays for us. And so we want to partner with him because when we don't know what to pray, he'll tell us, he'll tell us what to pray. And so that, that wraps it up. Uh, I hope that this all made sense to you and Keep alert, keep alert, pray, put on the full armor of God, dress your mind for battle, and also just remember that the battle belongs to the Lord. So that's why we lean in for prayer. Let, let God do the heavy lifting. Trust Jesus, his, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I hope this message blessed you, and I will see you next time.